Thank you, Pastor Lynn, for giving me a few minutes this morning to share once again what I see God doing in the field of Bible translation. Uh, while I am speaking, the, the photos um, behind me in the background are just some I took on my recent uh, ministry trip to, to Botswana. I was there to lead the technical aspects of a Bible translation workshop, and more importantly, to train a local IT person to, to do that work completely by himself in the future, uh, because that is how Wycliffe Associates works. We don't own the translation projects. We train and empower the national churches to do the work themselves and to own it. And uh, I was really impressed with the 20 translators with whom we worked down there in Gaborone, Botswana. They were mature, they were hardworking, they knew what they needed to do. They had worked together before twice and had already translated most of the New Testament. And by the end of the workshop, we were able to print 25 copies of the first draft of the New Testament, as well as a few books of the Old Testament. And the translators, yes, <laughs> amen. There's uh, nothing more exciting to me than that. The translators were going to take these books home with them and continue working on them, revising and checking. And the pastors were going to take these books and immediately begin preaching from them. And they predicted that there would be a great impact on the people's understanding of the gospel as a result. You know, the needs for Bible translation vary between countries. There are places in this world where translators, as we speak, are working underground in secret translating the word of God into the language of their people because they risk their lives in so doing. And some have actually lost their lives. Um, in Nigeria, you may have read the link in the Friday Blast this week. There was a pastor's conference in Nigeria, and the pastor, it was a large one, the pastors identified 250 languages in their country that need Bible translation. In Indonesia, the needs are even greater, and they're further along in the process, by the way. They have a goal to start 500 language projects in that country in the next year. Numbers like these um, are unprecedented, and they give, they give us hope that Vision 2025, a Bible in every language by the year 2025, is possible. It's always been possible by God, but now it takes less faith to believe it because of the numbers we're seeing. Um, I've heard that in refugee camps in different places in the world, Christians are working on Bible translation. Not by their own choice, they have lots of time on their hands to do this work. And it's amazing to see God's hand. Uh, just praise God for uh, the phenomenon, the explosive growth of the spread of the gospel throughout the world today. And, and uh, I want you to be a part of it also. We all can pray. Uh, we can give financially, and the financial needs are great. And as you look at the broader picture of um, what God is doing in the world, you realize that God can use any of the skills and abilities that we are willing to offer to advance the, the kingdom of God on earth. Even, even a basketball player can be used to advance the gospel, right, Tim? Wycliffe Associates strives to, to educate the church in America about, uh, about what's happening, and one of the ways they do this is through banquets that are held in, in cities across the country. There will be one in Lakewood, Colorado on May 9th, and uh, you may be hearing more about this. I'm hoping that some of you can take advantage of this opportunity to be an even bigger part of what's happening. So thank you very much. Thorn, uh, there we go, and keep his mic on too. This is un, un uh, announced, unrehearsed. Yeah. So, how long did it used to take a translation to take place um, into a language? Well, the traditional methods were that a um, a very highly educated Westerner would go into a village and have to learn the language, learn the culture of the people, and it would take. 
um, easily 20 years to, to translate the Bible. In some cases, it took much longer than that. Okay. And so now, with uh, the system you all use called MAST, how, how quickly can uh, translation be done? Many New Testament translations are being done in less than one year now. And that's because of the collaborative nature of the process. Many translators working together. So, so one of the questions that that uh, we might ask is: So, okay, is it the quality of the translation lesser than? I mean, are they really getting the word of God? That's a a very good question. And uh, actually, a couple of studies have been done on this, and professional linguists have evaluated the quality of the translation, and they have said that there is no difference in the quality. And um, part of that is a, a part of the reason for that is the process that God has um, has given us for 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 doing the translation and for using multiple people to do the checking. And um, yeah, it uh, the quality is um, is as good or better when the people use the methods that we that God has given us. So a team approach is a good good approach. Huh? So, um, aside from praying and giving, which we will all be happy to do, I'm sure, um, can you imagine a, a way that anyone from our congregation could be involved other than those two things? Wow. Um, could, could somebody, for instance, do what you do? Sure. Um, <laughs> I. Um, are, are you like a computer expert, I mean, you can tear a computer down, build it, but does, does somebody have to have all that to be able to do what, what, what you do? No. Um, when I applied to, as a volunteer for Wycliffe Associates, they gave me a long survey of uh, skills, and I filled that out, and I realized that most of what they do I hadn't done before, although I was familiar with the terms, um, and, and they took me anyway. And that was about three years ago, and uh, I've gotten more and more involved since, and, and learned a lot to contribute. So I think that um, not every skill, we don't have any basketball players in Wycliffe Associates, but... Uh, well, we should remedy that. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, many skills related to education and linguistics, of course, and uh, technology are very useful. Awesome. Thank you, Larry. So I wanted to take a, 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 a chance and interrupt that unrehearsed, uh, ask a few questions because First Baptist Church has been called by God to be a force for good in Golden and beyond by being disciples of Jesus. Now that last part sometimes hangs us up. We think that what that means is I'm going to open my Bible up and I'm going to disciple somebody. I'm going to teach them. I'm going to train them. Well, it could be that God wants to take the skills you have right now and plant you in a place for a short amount of time like what Larry does and work with a team of people who love Jesus just like you and who have a passion and a heart to get the Word of God in the hands of people around the world. This is an opportunity um, that, that you might be able to do something with, whether you're a mind student or whether you retire. This is something that, that God might use you and me to do. So I would encourage you to really be praying and thinking. Think way outside the box. God, what do you want me to do to be a force for good in Golden, in my neighborhood, in my place of business, in my sports club or whatever I do at school? How do you want me to be a force for good for your kingdom there? How can my discipleship make a difference? I don't think God has missed any single one of our names when he called people to be missionaries. We are all missionaries. We all live in a foreign field. We are all aliens and sojourners, the Bible calls us, passing through. And when we get too tied to the things of this world, we forget that. So, whether you're, you're, you're in the middle of school,
school or you're finishing up school, about to figure out where you want to go in the world, whether you are in the middle of your career climbing the corporate ladder, you've got your own business, you've got people that you depend on to, to fill out your team and your business, or your family is really what your emphasis is because you're a stay-at-home person or, or you're retired. God has a place for every single one of us. When we say as a church that we are a force for good and golden and beyond by being disciples of Jesus, that means we're only that if I'm that, if you're that, if we together are that. I want to pray before we get into the Word. You are a good, good Father. Think about you seated on your throne, worthy of our adoration and worship and praise, worthy of our very lives. We invite you to inspect what's going on in each of our hearts and souls. We invite you into the deepest parts of who we are. Father, we want to learn how to love you in everything we have. We want to learn to be the people you want us to be so we gather together on Sunday mornings and throughout the week sometimes. We lift up our voices in song and we let the words just wash over us. We pray together. We, we seek your face together. We open your word together. And we ask you through all of this, through our fellowship together, that you would meet with us and that you would transform us to be like Jesus help us to be better connected with you and with each other because we were here. Help us to grow more deeply in love with you, to grow in our spiritual maturity, to be challenged and equipped to engage our culture. Speak to us, God, as only you can. In Jesus' name. So Dostoevsky wrote a book called The Brothers Karamazov. And in this book, which, by the way, is a, an incredible book from this Russian author. I think you will en enjoy it immensely. Um, but in this, in this book, he, he tells the story of an, uh, a wealthy widow lady who has a conversation with an elderly monk in which she asks him, how can I know that God exists? And he says, you know, there really aren't a lot of great arguments that I could give you that are going to convince you that. What's really going to help you understand who God is and that he's there is to be someone who expresses love practically. To take what you know of God's love and live it out. And God will meet you there. She thought for a moment and she said, you know, there have been times throughout my life when I thought that I might want to give myself to humble service, serving other people. And she said, you know, I, I've thought about becoming part of the Sisters of Mercy and to give up everything so that I could humbly serve other people. But then I got to thinking. I think, I think maybe some of the people that I would serve might not be very grateful. I mean, the soup that I would give them wouldn't be hot enough. Uh, the bread that I would give them would be too hard, maybe stale. And, and the bed that I would give them to lie on might be too hard or, or too soft. And, and I just couldn't handle that ingratitude. And so I, I jettisoned the idea. I thought better of doing it. And as I do, I come back to this question. How can I know that God is real? And I love what Dostoevsky says. This is a quote from Emotionally Healthy Spirituality, but, but the phrase is from Dostoevsky. Love in practice is a harsh and dreadful thing compared to love in dreams. Love in practice is a harsh and dreadful thing compared to love in dreams. The nuts
nuts and bolts where the rubber meets the road, practical love rarely measures up to the dreams of love that we entertain ourselves with in our thoughts and our daydreams. I think this is a truth that is especially hard to swallow when it comes to our love relationship with God. To be in a love affair with the most perfectly loving being might conjure up issues of long periods of bliss and ecstasy. But the reality of your love affair with God might be a little different. For the past two weeks, we've been dissecting Jesus' summation of the entirety of the Old Testament law. When he said that we are to love the Lord our God with all our hearts, with all our minds, with all our soul, with all our strength. And he challenges us to make that the core of who we are, to make that the core of what we do. And so last week, we, we saw what it meant to love the Lord our God with all our heart. To love the Lord our God with all our heart is to love with the totality of our inner self, to love him with complete integrity. When you love God with your whole heart, your love is not hypocritical. Your yes is yes, your no is no. When you say something, you mean it. Your love for God is the same when you're in a crowd as when you're by yourself. Your love for God in public simply reflects what is already true in private. That's what it means to love your, the Lord your God with all your Jesus expands on it and helps us understand better what he means when we talk about loving God as he expands this command. And he said, love the Lord your God with all your heart and love the Lord your God with all your soul. To love the Lord your God is an all-encompassing sort of love. One Hebrew linguist described it this way, the soul is the living and active being of its possessor. The soul is the living and active being of its possessor. In other words, the soul is who you are. The heart talks about my internal being, being a person of integrity. When I say I love God, my actions show it. The soul brings in everything, everything about us. When God breathed the breath of life into Adam, he made Adam a living creature. Now that phrase, living creature, is the word soul. So this is how the translation goes. Then the Lord God formed the man out of dust from the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a soul. When Jacob and his mother schemed to steal Esau's birthright, they really played it up right. Jacob's mother went and got some meat and prepared it just like Esau did. She sent Jacob over to Esau's tent to get some of his clothes, spread some dirt all over it so it would smell just like him, took some animal skins because Esau was evidently super hairy, and put it on his arms and his hands and on his neck can you imagine what this guy must have looked like? They, they did all this so that they could fool his father who was hopelessly blind. And I guess if you look at his life, he's probably pretty clueless about this time of his life as well. But he, they did it so that they could fool him. And, and this is how the passage reads. And this word soul comes out in this in a really unique way. Um, uh, Jacob's father says to him, bring the meat near to me, bring it to me, that I may eat of my son's game and bless you. The word you is the word soul. You have a heart. You are a soul. Your soul makes up what is uniquely you. You have a heart, 
life, you are a soul. So to love with one's soul is to love with the essence of everything that makes you, you. Your soul is the fullness of you. It is the complete package. So think about that understanding of the word soul when you hear these familiar words from Isaiah. My soul yearns for you in the night. What's Isaiah saying? God, everything that I have cries out to you. You ever been in a place like that? I can tell you there have been times in my life when I I couldn't just shoot an arrow. I had to just pour myself out to God. The last couple days have been kind of hard for our family. My father-in-law is in the hospital and uh, he's been struggling with, with some physical issues for a little bit. And last night he had what they think might have been a stroke. I can tell you that my soul has been crying out to God this morning. You ever been there? He's a good, good father. And we can cry out to him. That's what this is about. Our souls crying out to him. The other thing you need to know about your soul is your soul, even though when he talks about it and uses the term soul. He kind of means everything. There's something unique about the soul. The soul is the true you. What is uniquely you. And the soul is what separates from the body when you die. O oh God, you are my God. Earnestly I seek you, my soul, that's our word, thirst for you, my flesh, this body, so he separates it, it's a physical part of me, faints for you, as in a dry and weary land where there is no water. So my body is impacted, but when we are separated from our bodies and we go to be with the Lord, our soul is what lives on forever. Worship. The lifestyle of the person who values God is a whole person experience that leaves nothing of you out. Now, I grew up in a fight and fundy Baptist church where whole body worship was not something we did. And because of my inability and the, maybe the tone of my skin, I can't dance. If I could... I would, so praise God for you. <laughs> but that's what he's talking about. Offering up everything. That's why David danced before the Lord with all of his might. He didn't care what anyone else thought. He just knew that everything he was, everything that he had came to him from his father. And he wanted him to know that he loved him. And he appreciated him. That's what whole soul love is. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. It's kind of easy to let those words roll off our tongues. But think about what it means to bless the Lord with your whole soul. To praise Him, to honor Him, to glorify Him with everything you have and everything you are. One commentator summarized the whole soul love as this. Love God with everything you are in every way possible. So to love God with my whole soul is reflected in how we love God with the things we value, with what we desire, with what we think about, with how we see and interact in the world, with how we invest our time, with how we study, with how we go about our business, whether our business is school, employment, or retirement. Whole soul love becomes apparent 
to others in how we talk, how we invest our resources, our time, our money, our abilities. It becomes apparent in how we handle disappointment, how we handle a failure, and how we handle success. Sometimes when our heart is broken, we think God has abandoned us. And we allow our soul to wander away from Him. I think God wants us to understand. He will never leave us. He will never forsake us. But He doesn't take pain out of the world. He puts His presence in us to walk us through the pain so that we can learn to love him with everything we have, even in the pain, even in the loss, even in the sadness, even in the success. I've been discipling a young man, and I was talking to his father, and his father said, I'm a little concerned things are going well for him, and I'm beginning to hear him talk like he doesn't really need God in his life now. been there. I've done that. God, through Moses, warned the people of Israel in Deuteronomy. He said, hey, after you get into the land and you're, you're prospering, remember that it's the Lord your God who gave you the ability to create wealth. You catch that? God gives us the ability to create wealth. So everything that I have, and the wealth can be financial, the wealth can be your health, it can be in relationship, it can be in so many other things. Every good and perfect gift, James 1.17 says, comes down into our lives from our Father, the God of heavenly lights who never changes and loves to bless that's who he is. Our entire being, our behavior, how we react and interact when we love God with our whole soul, all of us puts God on display in every way. That's what it means to glorify God. When you put God's character on display through your life, that brings glory to God. And it's because you're loving him with your whole soul. Whatever the situation is. I appreciate so much the words of the novelist George MacDonald. Have you, if you've not read anything by George, George MacDonald, you've you got to do it. It's awesome. But aside from the, the many books that he wrote, he also wrote a lot of letters. And he amassed quite a, quite a collection. Well, one of the letters that he wrote was to his 16-year-old daughter, Mary. Listen to what he said to her. He wrote this because he wanted her to understand God's love so that she could allow God to be the guiding person in her life. He said, God is so beautiful and so patient and so loving and so generous that he is the heart and soul and rock of every love and every kindness and every gladness in the world. It all flows out of him. All the beauty in the world and in the hearts of men, all the painting, all the poetry, all the music, all the architecture comes from his heart first. He is so lovable that no heart can know how lovable he is. It can only know part. When the best loves God best, he does not love him nearly as he deserves or as he will love him in return. first time I read that, it kind of made me blush. And it takes a lot to do that. But it did because I realized what I was reading. I was reading George MacDonald's whole soul love letter to his daughter about his God. Have you ever 
thought those thoughts about God. That's why we need someone like George McDonald. I would never imagine thinking something like that, but now I can't stop thinking about it. Because I want to love God with everything that I have. I don't want to feel like I have to earn His love. Anyone out there relate to that? I don't want to feel like that because I blew it, He's not going to love me anymore. The reality is, if I think those things, it's because I don't know His love well enough. And it's just a call for me to love Him more and to let Him love me. We need to realize that God wants us to believe in Him. You know why? Because He believes in us. He created you to be uniquely you. He put you in this church at this time for a specific reason. This morning, He wants to say to you, I love you. I made you just like you are. I saw the mistake you made before you made it. You don't have to go through your life feeling guilty. You can just bring it to me and let's work it out. It's already been taken care of on the cross. And that kind of God deserves whole soul love. Nothing, nothing else will do. God is not looking for 98% of your love. He's looking for 100% of it. If we, he could require 110%, that's what he'd require. Because that's what he gives. And as we give back to him, as we revel in his love, he completely changes us. So what I want to do the rest of our time together is I want to talk about how we can cultivate a whole soul love for God. How can you, how can I, how can we corporately cultivate a, a whole soul soul love for God. And I'm just going to offer two things that come really from the word itself for soul. You ever find yourself staring at one of your grandkids, grandma and grandpa? You ever find yourself doing that? I was, I was uh, at lunch with somebody and stepped out to go to the restroom or something and came back and they're staring at their phone. Well, first I was amazed that they had a smartphone. Second, I was, I, was, I was not surprised when they quickly turned it around and said, this is my latest picture of my grandchild. They were staring at the grandchild. You ever catch yourself doing that? You ever catch yourself staring at your spouse if you're married? You know how you get that feeling somebody's looking at you? You ever have somebody look at you and go, why are you staring? Or maybe you find yourself staring at a car you really want. We had a realtor and this realtor uh, walked us into his cubicle and in his, uh, on the wall of his cubicle was one thing. It was the latest BMW. And the guy had it on his phone. He had a picture in his car. He kept staring at this BMW because that's what he really wanted. More than anything else. Maybe, maybe for you, you've been staring at a job, a position, a role. When we find ourselves doing that, we're living out a universal principle. And this is not original with me. I, I don't remember where I first read it or I'd give credit. But the, 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 the statement is this, we love to look at what we love. We love to look at what we love. That's why someone can say, hey, you want to know what somebody loves? Look at their checkbook. Actually, wait a minute. How many people in this room have a checkbook? A few, okay? Any more, yeah, I mean, most, a lot of people don't have checkbooks anymore, right? It's all electronic. You can look at how somebody spends their money because what we spend our money on kind of reflects what we continually look at, what we continually pay attention to. And we love to look at what we love. Now, the lawyer's question that prompted Jesus' response to love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength was meant as a trick to try to catch Jesus in his words. 
Well, rather than getting caught up in wrangling over the minutia of the law, Jesus showed us what, or should I say who, he loved. Who he was continually thinking about. And I want to say this very carefully. Jesus was not in love with the law of God. Jesus was in love with the God of the law. With his whole soul, he loved his father. He would slip off early in the morning, and he would slip off late at night to be with his father. You couldn't have a conversation with the man without him bringing up his father. In the Gospel of John, he says, I don't say anything that I haven't heard my father say. I don't do anything I haven't seen my father do. I don't have a desire to go anywhere my father hasn't told me to go because he was constantly, continually thinking about his father. He loved his father with his whole soul. He was not enamored with the law of God. He was in love with the God of God of the law because he loved his father with his whole soul you want to cultivate the whole soul love invest time looking at Jesus invest time thinking about who he is a couple simple ways that you might do this you could choose one of the gospels and just start reading and as you get to something that catches your attention, pay attention to what Jesus is doing. Ask yourself, what, what does this say about who Jesus is? What does this say about how Jesus relates to people? What does this say about what Jesus thinks of me? Focus on that or, or cherry pick a story that intrigues you about Christ. Let me give you a couple examples. Maybe you feel like you've betrayed Jesus and you're convinced that there's nothing you can do to get back into his good graces. You've done something wrong for the 103rd time and you don't think he will ever trust you again. Because you know if somebody wrongs you twice, fool me once, shame on me. Fool me twice, shame on you. Right? You know if somebody blows it twice with you, you're sure not going to give them the time of day. We have to be careful not to read how we see the world back into who God is. We think that we've betrayed God so many times he could never use us again. You want to read John 21. You want to read John 21 and you want to put yourself in the boat As one of the other disciples says, hey, Jesus is on the shore. And you throw your cloak on and you dive into the water and you swim. You're not really sure why you did it because, well, you're just impulsive that way. That's what we know about Peter. He's always impulsive. He opens his mouth before his brain's engaged all the time. He does things that get him and other people in trouble all the time. Like, can you imagine what it was like? He swims to shore, he gets out of the water, and he sees Jesus. And Jesus isn't looking him in the face, I don't think. I think Jesus is over there by the fire. He's got fish all ready to go. Peter and all the other guys sit around the fire and they eat breakfast with Jesus. It's amazing. The fish is the best they've ever had. It isn't even any of the fish they caught because he already had it cooked before they got there. Incredible setting. Peter is probably not in his most prominent place like he always was. He was behind two or three guys. Had his head down, just eating, minding his own business. And then the conversation that Peter dreaded started. Jesus looks at him and says, uh, Peter, do you love me more than these? You can read it for yourself. But imagine what it would be like if you were having that conversation with Jesus. And you know the way you betrayed him. What would Jesus say to you? That'd be a great thing to find out.
maybe you're in a terrifying situation because you stepped out in faith and you were trusting Jesus for you. Maybe you really need to read Matthew 14. You have been rowing with the, your buddies all night long. The, the, the white caps are all around you. You're doing everything you can to keep the boat from capsizing, and all of a sudden you see something. You're like, no, 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 can't be, can't be. And all of a sudden, it's a ghost! And Jesus says, oh, no, no, wait, 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 it's me. And when you hear his voice, you're calm. The storm is still the same, but you're calm. And you notice something really weird. You've been worried. Jesus isn't worried. He's walking on the water. He's calm. He's probably smiling. You know what you look like when you're scared, right? You walk around the corner and you scare somebody. <laughs> and you, you see that look on their face. And what's it make you do? It makes you laugh. makes you smile. Jesus is probably smiling because he saw the look on all their faces. And then can you imagine the thrill, maybe trepidation that you feel when he says, come on out. Could it be that you're in that terrifying time because Jesus wants you to walk on the water with him? Maybe you long to know God better. You want to love him more. You've tapped into God's heart. John 14 may be a passage you would want to read. And meditate on verse 23, which reads, All who love me will do what I say. My Father will love them and we will come and make our home with each of them. That last phrase. We will come and make our home with each of them. That's intimacy. That's closeness. That's something that God wants you to experience. Whatever passage you're reading, think about what does this passage tell me about my Father? Maybe you're not here yet. Maybe, maybe you're in the midst of one of those difficult things. And maybe the thing that you need to do is to follow Natalie Grant, the musician's advice, and pray, asking God to help you want the healer more than the healer. To help you want the Savior more than the saving. To help you want the giver more than the giving. To help you want Jesus more than anything. Whatever the situation you find yourself in, look at Jesus. Keep your eyes on Him. Because we love, we, we love to look at what we love. And if we want to cultivate a whole soul love, we'll invest time looking at Jesus. Now, the second way we can do that is, is kind of hiding in plain sight within the Word itself. The base meaning of the root of the word is breath. What I think he's saying is every breath you take is a gift from God. Because we know if you stop breathing, you stop living. Right? Every breath we take is a gift from God. So in using this word to describe the entirety of who you are, God is saying every breath, all life is valuable. But this flies in the face of the prevailing voices and positions of power and media in 2019, like we, we preached about last week as we talked about ending after birth abortion or infanticide. And I want to revisit this. It just seems a super appropriate way to do this with the meaning of this word. Continuing to build public case for de the devaluation of babies and children, the CNBC published an article, and this article decried the cost of having a baby. Uh, the title of the article read, Here's How Much Money You Can Save When You Don't Have Kids. Your friends may tell you having kids has made them happier. They're probably lying. Research shows that parenthood leads to a happiness gap. Maybe that's because the pleasures of parenthood are outweighed by all the extra responsibilities, housework, and of course the costs. Maybe that's why Americans are having fewer children than ever before. Just how much can you expect to save if you don't have kids? You want to know the number? They say it's $467,000 
a parent will spend on each child. If you don't have kids, in short, they conclude, you will save a bunch of money. Now listen to what the cultural elitist bioethicists who write on this subject say about afterbirth abortion. We claim that killing a newborn could be the ethically permissible could be ethically permissible in all circumstances where abortion would be. Such circumstances include cases where the newborn has the potential to have and in parentheses at least acceptable life but the well-being of the family is at risk. In other words, the baby could have an acceptable life, but to allow them to do that would be a problem for the family. We propose to call this practice afterbirth abortion rather than infanticide. They understand what they're doing. To emphasize that the moral status of the individual killed, their words, not mine, is comparable with that of a fetus, on which abortions in the tri traditional sense are performed rather than that of a child. Commenting on, on this bioethicist's um, study, that was just a portion of it, um, Kelly Boggs from the Baptist Press wrote this. The authors use the exact same arguments to justify infanticide that abortion advocates use in defense of killing preborn children. After all, what is the moral difference between killing a full-term baby minutes before delivery allowed under Roe v. Wade and its subsequent decisions and killing it after delivery? If personhood requires a measure of consciousness, an aim, or a function, then what do we do with those who are mentally challenged? What about the physically handicapped? How about those who suffer from Alzheimer's? With all these Will all these be classified as non-persons and become disposable? Have Governor Richard Lamb's words from 1984 been shown to be prophetic when he said the elderly sick have a duty to die? To love God with your whole soul is to value the gift of life that God has given. Thomas Jefferson said, the care of human life and happiness and not their destruction is the first and only object of good government. The first and only object of good government. I think Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.'s words can wisely guide us through the 21st century abortion minefields. He said, Cowardice asks the question, is it safe? Expediency asks the question, is it politic? Vanity asks the question, is it popular? But conscience asks the question, is it right? There comes a time, he said, when one must take a position that is neither safe, nor politic, nor popular, but because conscience tells one it is it is right to stand up for life because when we value life, we reveal our whole soul love for God. So if we want to cultivate a whole soul love for God, we invest ourselves in looking at Jesus and we value life. We had a prayer request last week from one of our mind students asking us to pray for the pro-life club on the campus. Maybe that'd be a way that you could choose to value life. The end of this month on the 29th, a movie's coming out called Unplanned, and we showed the video clip for it, uh, the trailer last week. We're going to get a group together to go and see that. It's a story of a lady who, who was the youngest director of an abortion clinic. And then she went to the, the back room and she saw what was happening. And she experienced, she had been told that the babies aren't viable, they're not real, they don't feel anything. And she saw this little infant in his mother's womb, trying to get away from the needle, trying to get away from the thing that was going to harm him. Maybe you're here today, and I, I don't want to be cavalier. If you have been and you've felt the tragedy and the pain of, of abortion, 
um, this is not judgment. This is, this is compassion and love saying, that's not anything that's going to keep you away from God. God's love is so powerful and strong and there for you. And so are we. But we just need to make sure that from here on, we take a stand and say no. If we're going to love God with our whole soul, it means we're going to value life. And it means we're going to do it in a compassionate way. We don't, we don't say we love a baby by hating a person. That's ridiculous. My moral outrage doesn't give me the right to treat someone immorally. Whole soul love for God means that I'm going to love everyone just like he loved me. Just like he loved me. Sin and all. Warts and all. I think we need to work to abend, or to end afterbirth abortion. That sounds very pious and quite acceptable and polite company to say I love God with all my heart and soul. But I want to take us back to Dostoevsky. Love and practice is a harsh and dreadful thing compared to love and dreams. We can say it, but the harsh and dreadful, rubber meets the road, practical sort of love can be messy. And that's what he's calling us to. Nurture the whole soul love for God by investing time looking at Jesus and valuing all of life. Let's pray together. Thank you, God, for life that we can enjoy. Help us to value it. Help us to remember that it's been a gift given to us by you. And as we look to you, as we look at you, may we love you more. And may we appreciate and value this gift you've given us. Challenge each of us, Lord, right where we are, to invest more time with you, looking at you, gazing on you, enjoying you. We want to be people who are a force for good in Golden and beyond by being disciples, by loving you.